We're going to talk first about a data structure that is going to be very useful for other algorithms that we're going to be talking about in this course. So priority queues is an application of binary trees in the sense that it is actually a binary tree which is holding the actual data structure that we're going to be using. So what is a priority queue? A priority queue is basically like a queue. Remember in the queue, we insert elements on one end and we extract elements from the other end using our in queue and the queue operations. In the case of a priority queue, each one of the elements that is inserted into the queue has a given value or has a given key. And what we are going to do is we're going to extract the elements in order based on that key. So we can set it up in such a way that the priority queue always extracts the minimum element from all the elements that are already in the queue, or we can set it up such that a priority queue always extracts the maximum element from among the elements that are already in the queue. So the priority queue has several methods, which are the basic ones that we're going to be talking about. So the methods that we can use in a priority queue are going to be extract max or extract min, depending if what we have is a max queue or a min queue. We have an insert where we insert an element. Remember that element can be anything that you want, but it has to contain a key. And of course, that element has to be comparable, implement comparable meaning that it has to have implemented and compared to function. That is the one that I'm going to use to determine which element is larger than which in order to be able to extract the maximum or extract the minimum. We're going to have one method that is able to build the heap. Uh, what is a heap? Well, the priority queue is going to be stored in a data structure that is called a heap. So that is why I'm going to be calling this uh, method build build heap, uh, which actually takes as input an array of elements, and it's just going to create the data structure that I need in order to be able to extract the minimum or the maximum. Let's say that build heap is like doing the insert many times. If I have an elements, I could insert n times those elements into the heap, or I can do that in just one single instruction by actually sending an array that contains all the elements that are going to be inserted and creating the heap in just one single step. Uh, the difference, as we're going to talk about later, is the running time of the operations. It is much faster to build a heap in just one single instruction rather than to keep inserting the n elements, and we're going to talk about that at some point. And then we have uh, two methods that are going to become useful later that are going to be, if there is a value that is already inserted into the, into the heap, we can actually decide to modify that value. If we decrease that value, then we have to call the decrease key method. If we increase the value, we have to call the increase key method. Those two methods act in a different way. That's why we have those two methods separate. But if you want, you can uh, have a method that is called modify key and then modify key is going to determine the value of the new key that you have, how it compares to the value of the old value that was stored, and depending if it's an increase or decrease, it's going to internally call, call the methods decrease key or increase key, which are going to be private methods. So as I said, this is going to be implemented using um, data structure that is called a heap. So let me illustrate some of the properties that a heap must have. All right, so what is a heap? Well, a heap is a data structure, which is actually a tree that satisfies several properties. First of all, we can have two different kinds of heap. One heap is called a max heap, and the other heap is going to be called a min heap. We use a max heap when we want to have a max queue and what uh, we want to do is to extract the maximum every time, or we can have a mean heap where we have to extract the minimum. What is important to get from here is that you cannot do both at the same time. You cannot have a mean heap and max heap simultaneously. You either have a mean heap or you have a max heap 
or if you want to do both, then you need two heaps. You need to have two data structures, one to extract by maximum and one to extract by minimum. So how is the heap going to be stored? Uh, the heap is going to be a complete binary tree, but um, the last level might not be complete. So you can imagine a binary search tree or a binary tree where every level is complete, meaning that it has all, every vertex has two children, and it keeps going all the way up to the lowest level where the leaves are. So the lowest level might not be complete, but that is the only level that is not going to be complete. Every other level before the lowest level has to be complete. And the lowest level might not be complete, but even if it is not complete, it is still has to satisfy the property that it might not be complete, but it has to be complete from left to right. So the elements but that might be missing from that level would be only the rightmost elements and the left elements have to be there. So that is what we mean when we say that a heap is going to be a complete binary tree. There are different kinds of uh, heaps that we can use. In the case of a binary heap, we represent the heap using a binary tree. So each one of the elements is going to have two, at most two children, because it's a binary tree. But we can have KRE heaps where each one of the elements, each one of the nodes can have up to K children. Then there is another property which is very important, which is called the heap property. Right, the heap property is the property that allows us to extract the minimum or to extract the maximum, depending on the type of heap that we are using. So what is this heap property? This heap property says that whenever you find a node, that value, the value of the key of that node, has to be greater than to the values of each one of its children. I'm going to assume at this point that the heap does not contain duplicate elements. So if I'm building a max heap, then the value that is going to be stored as the root of my heap is going to be the largest element of my entire tree because the element that is stored as root of my heap is going to be larger than both of its children, which are the left subtree and the right subtree. And so the values stored in the left subtree, root of the left subtree is in turn going to be larger than all the elements stored in that subtree and so on. So really the value that is stored as the root of a heap is always going to be the element that is the largest of the entire list of elements. All right, so what does a heap look like? Well, a heap is going to be stored as an array. So the numbers that are represented in here are actually the indices of the elements of the array. The second element of my array is going to be at position two. The third element of the array is stored position three. And so we go in this order, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. Remember that we said that a binary heap has to be a complete tree. And so the only thing that could happen is that the the lowest level might not be complete, but it has to be complete from left to right, which means, as we can see here, it's complete from left to right. The only elements that would be missing might be the elements that are to the right. So as you can also see, each one of the nodes of this binary tree has two children. The idea of representing it in this way is so that we can easily find the parent and we can easily find the children by performing very simple operations. Before I show you the formulas, let's try to see if we can figure them out. So who is the left child of a node? If you give me the index to a node, let's say i equals three, can you tell me who the left child is? So you can see in this case, the left child was six, which is two times three. Will that happen always? Well, let's see. In this case, this is two, the left child is four. Let's check this one. This one is 10, left child is 20. Let's see this one. This one is 13, left child is 26. All right, so what is going to happen is that you give me a node, let's say I, an index 
a position on the array, you can always know who the left child is just multiplying that i by 2. Can you find the right child? Of course, we just have to multiply it by 2 and add 1, right? So this is 3 times 2, which is 6, plus 1 is going to be 7, so 7 is going to be the right child of 3. Who is going to be the right child of 6? Six, plus, 6 times 2, that's 12 plus 1, that is going to be 13. And as you can see, that is always going to be the case. 9 times 2, that's 18, plus 1, that is 19. So it is very easy to find the left child and the right child given an index. Question, can we find the parent? All right, so let's see. Uh, we already know that the left-hand child is going to be 2 times i. So how do I find the parent? Well, divided by 2, right? So 6 divided by 2, that is 3. 12 divided by 2, that is 6. But uh, what happens, for example, with this 13? 13 divided by 2, that is 6.5. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to truncate and get rid of, um, of the decimals. And basically, I'm going to take the function that is called the floor, right? Function floor is going to get rid of the decimal places. So I can compute the floor of 15 over 2. 15 over 2 is 7.5. The floor of that is 7, and that is going to give me the corresponding parent. The floor of 27 over 2, that is 13.5, and that is going to give me the index of the parent. And so we can verify the formulas. So, for example, the parent of k is just going to be the floor of k divided by 2. And that is going to happen if k is greater than 1. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that k has no parent. So who is the left child of k? The left child of k, as we said before, is just 2k. And the right child of k is going to be 2k plus 1. So um, these simple formulas are an advantage of starting my array in position 1 instead of starting it in position 0. If I started at position 0, I can still get formulas like these ones, but there might be a little bit more complicated than this. All right, so back to our basic operations. So we're going to need to talk about how to implement each one of the operations. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about extracting the max. So for all these examples and all the coding that we're going to do, I'm going to assume that uh, we're talking about a max heap, okay? Min heap is implemented exactly the same. But instead of using greater than or equal sign, we use less than or equal sign wherever they appear. So let me talk about the algorithm to perform an extract max on the tree. So a way to do this simple way that might not work initially. So let's take a look at uh, what we would do in order to extract the maximum. So to extract the maximum, we know that the element that is the root of the tree is always going to be the maximum element. So notice that this tree that I have here satisfy the property that I said that uh, all, all heaps are hard to satisfy. In this case, it is called, as I said before, the heap property. So we can see we have here this number one, number two, three, the small numbers that appear here are actually the indices of the array. So we're keeping all these numbers stored in an array. <clears throat> but we imagine that they actually represent the tree. And the elements, the keys that are stored for each one of the elements, are the ones represented here as each one of the nodes of this binary tree. So, for example, that means that element that is stored in position number four of the array has a key value of 14. The element that is stored in position 11 of the array has a key value of 12, and so on. So we have this stored. Now it satisfies the heap property and if you check each one of the elements, like for example this element 17, has to be greater than the values of each one of its children. If I want to extract the maximum element, the idea is very easy. The only thing that you have to do is to return the root of the tree because the root of the tree is going to always going to is always going to contain the largest element and so you can extract the maximum. But there is a problem there because if you extract the maximum from here, now the tree does not contain a root. So what do we do? 
Well, a simple way of uh, completing the tree again is let's go and take the last element from the tree because from here we don't really know who the second largest element is. We only know that the largest element is the one that is stored as the root of the tree. We don't really know who the second largest element is and so there is no way to know which one we would have to replace immediately. So uh, the easiest possible way is find the value that we know that exists immediately, which is the last element, and just copy that element to the root of the tree. So after performing that operation, the eight, which was the element that was the last element of the array, is now going to be the root of the tree but the position where that eight was is now going to be vacant and nothing is there because I removed one element. So my tree that had initially 12 elements, now after removing this element, element 20 now has 11 elements. But as you can easily see from here, we have a problem. The problem is that it is no longer a heap, a heap because it does not have to satisfy the heap property because as you can see, element number eight is not greater than 16 and 17. So the question is, how do I make it a heap again now that it's no longer a heap? All right, well, it, not everything is as bad as it looks because if you take a look at this binary tree, the only element that is out of place is going to be the root, which in this case contains element number eight. So what we can do is we can try to do the following. So you compare this root with the left subtree, well, the left child and the value of the right child. And the maximum of those three values, you're going to swap it with eight. So for example, in this case, what do we do? We have eight, 16, and 17, which is the maximum, the largest of those three values. The largest of these, those three values is 17. So what do we do? We swap 17 with eight, and we are now sure that that 17, if we put the 17 as the root of the tree, we are completely sure that that 17 is actually larger than the element that is on the left subtree, because we already compared that, right? And since this element on the left subtree is larger than all the elements here, then I don't have to worry about the left subtree anymore. So let me just say it one more time. I'm going to compare these three elements I'm going to find out who the largest element is, and I'm going to swap it with the element that was out of place. So now I swap 17 with eight. Now 17 is going to be the root. I already know that that 17 is larger than 16 because I compared it when I compared these three elements. And since 16 is greater than all the elements in its subtree, then I know that 17 is larger than all the elements in this subtree. And so this left-hand side still satisfies the heap property. Now, what is going to happen is that now 8, which was moved where 17 was, is now going to be out of place. And then I would have to go continue repeating this process again. So I now have 8 in this position, and I would have to compare it to the left and right, and then keep going and going down. This, pro this process of moving down this tree is going to be called sift down. So the result after swapping the 17 with the 8, is shown here and as you can see now this section here is no longer a heap doesn't satisfy the heap property so we have to recursively go down and again perform the same operation and check to see which one of this is the largest one now the largest one is 15 and then we will swap 8 with 15. so now this is the result of swapping the 15 with the 8 and now 8 happens to be in its final position. Now it has no children and everything is okay and it satisfies the heap property. So the idea again is very easy. It is to start with a node at the root that does not satisfy the heap property and start recursively going down the tree until it finds its final place, its correct place. So let's take a look at what the algorithm, complete algorithm is going to look like. All right, so just repeating very briefly, 
extract maximum. How do we extract the maximum? All right, we said that in order to extract the maximum, the only thing that we are going to do is we're going to locate the maximum element, which is the first element of the heap, which is going to be A of one. And we are going to then put the last element of the heap, which is A of n, in the position where the first element was. And of course, we are going to decrement the size of the heap by one. And after we do that, the element that was stored at position one is now not necessarily going to satisfy the heap property. And so what we do is we perform a shift down operation, which is going to be a recursive operation, trying to find the final position of that element. And we only do this as long as the heap is not empty, meaning that the number of elements in the heap has to be greater than zero. So let's take a look at our shift down method and see how it would work. All right, so here is our shift down method. So I'm going to start in this case, let's say that I is one, and I'm going to start from this position. First thing to know is that the element that I am going to try so to shift down has actually children. And to make sure that it has children, I have to make sure that it has at least a left child. So to know that a node has a left child, the only thing that I have to do is I have to see if the index of the left child is actually less than or equal to the value of n. For example, in the case of six, the left, the left child of six, which is going to be 12, is going to be greater than n because in this case, there are only 11 ele <coughs> elements in the heap. So in this case of one, we multiply once by two, we are going to get two, and two is less than or equal to 12, so it would actually work because it has at least a left child. So first comparison here is just to make sure that it has at least a left child, otherwise I do nothing. And after that, what I have to do is uh, find, as we said, compare these three elements and find the maximum. So, and let's say that J is going to be the index of the largest of those three. So in this case, what is the maximum of those three elements? The maximum of eight, 16, and seven is going to be 17. And the index or the position of that element is going to be equal to three. So in the case of this example, J is going to be equal to three. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see if the maximum was actually I, so the element that was the maximum was the one that is already the, the root of this sub tree, then I'm fine and there is nothing to do. So what is it that I have to do if it is not equal? As we said, we're going to swap it, right? So we swap AI with AJ. So we swap eight with 17, as we said before. And once we swap that, we are just going to recursively sit, sit down on J, which is now the position that contained the maximum, right? So so how long does it take to extract max? Well, extract max is going to use shift down. So uh, how long does it take to do shift down? Well, since a complete binary tree can have at most log n as its depth or its height, remember that the shift down operation starts from the top of the tree and every time, for every time that it does a recursive step, it's going to go one level down from the root all the way to the leaves. So the maximum number of operations, number of times that it has to do that process is going to be at most log of n, which is the maximum possible height of the tree. And so the worst case time complexity of the shift down operation is in the order of log of n. Now, everything else that is being done in the struct max can be done in, in constant time which is actually just uh, storing and um, updating values from the array. Remember that uh, what we do is we first say that the maximum is going to be the first element, a of one, and then we just swap a of one with a of n. So those two operations can be done in constant time. The only one that requires a little bit more time is going to be our shift down operation, which actually can be done in log of n. Therefore, the total running time of the entire extract max algorithm is going to be in log of n, which is actually pretty good. All right, so let's take a look at uh, the insertion operation. 
So let's assume that I want to insert an element into the heap. So initially, this heap has 11 elements. And I want to insert the element that is shown here in red. Element number 21 is going to be the new element that is going to be inserted into the heap. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place the element as the last element in the heap. So a of 12, so incrementing n, which was 11, is going to give me n equals to 12. And so a of 12, so the element that is going to be placed in position 12 is going to be equal to 21 to this largest element, new, new element that I'm going to insert. Now, it turns out that this element that I'm inserting might violate the heap property, as we can see from here, right? Because 21 greater than 8, so I would have to compare this 21 to 8 and swap it so that this 21 go, would go here. And now I have the 21 in this position. So now in this point, I would have to compare this element with its parent and see which one is the larger and then swap them and keep moving up until I find its actual position. So uh, in this process, instead of going down, we are going up. Remember the other process was called sift down. In this case, I'm going to call it bubble up. So I start with, a, with, a, with an element and I recursively try to go up the tree until I find its proper position. So let's take a look at this procedure and see how this algorithm would work. So the algorithm that we are doing now would be insert. So insert, as I said, is very easy. The only thing that it has to do initially is just increment the number of elements, store the new element that I want to insert as the last element of the array, and then recursively call bubble up on that position. So the only interesting and difficult part from here is going to be to go through the bubble up algorithm. So let me go through the bubble up method. So the bubble up method is again, a recursive method. Uh, bubble up, what it's going to do is it's going to take an index from which it's going to start moving everything up, right? So remember, this is very easy. The only thing that I have to do is I have to compare it with its parent. But the first thing to do is to make sure that, the tr that I'm actually not at the root of the tree because if I'm already at the root of the tree, I cannot go any, any higher. So the first thing is to check to make sure that the value that I have is not equal to one. Well, basically, if, if i is greater than 1, then i can do something. So then what we're going to do is we're going to find the maximum of the value of i and its corresponding parent. And the maximum is going to be called j. If it happens that the value, the maximum value is myself, right, i got i, that means that the value i, a of i, is actually larger than the parent. And so I have to swap the elements. So if j, if j is equal to i, then I have, have to swap a of i with its parent. And then I'm going to recursively call bubble up using the corresponding parent. All right, so that it was very easy. And this is the bubble, the bubble up uh, method. So let me briefly analyze uh, the insertion and bubble up. All right, so remember that when I perform an insert, uh, <coughs> the first thing that is going to happen is that I make an assignment. I just increment the value of n, assign that to n, and then that new value, a of n, is going to be equal to the value that I just got. So those two assignment operations can be done in constant time, so that wouldn't uh, really um, be important from the complexity point of view. So what is next is the bubble up method. So the bubble up method is the one that is going to uh, consume a little bit more of time. And the process of bubble up, remember it's a recursive process starting from a leaf and it bubbles up all the way to the root, possibly, right? So worst case, I have to go all the way to the root. But remember that the height of the tree is going to be uh, log of n and therefore the total number of operations that I require in order to bubble up is going to be in the order of uh, log n in the worst. So the next algorithm that we're going to talk about with respect to priority queues is going to be the build queue algorithm. So basically the idea is that this build queue algorithm is going to get as input, an array, and the size of the array. And the idea is to build a queue based on those elements that are given as input. 
The first uh, simple idea would be to take those elements and perform an inset operation for each one of the elements that we get from the array, so inserting one element at a time. Since the insert operation, we already know, we did analysis before, takes in the order of log n time. So we have n elements in total, and therefore the total running time is going to be n log n. It is uh, possible to do better in this case. So how is it that we can do better? What is that we have to do in order to try to do better? So the first idea that comes to mind is to try to use the array itself as a heap. So we could place 5, 12, 15, 7, 9, and 3, for example, in a heap. So it would look something like this. So we just frame them in a heap fashion. It would look something like this. So 5, 12, 15, 7, 9, and 3. Notice that even though this satisfies the property that it is a binary tree and that it is complete and that it is full from left to right on the last level. However, if this was a max heap, for example, it does not satisfy the heap property. And so we have to do something about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the last element that has children. In this case, notice the last child is going to be this node that appears here. So the last element with children is going to be this element here. So starting from this element, I'm going to perform a shift down operation. So I'm starting here using shift down. And I do shift down for this element, then shift down for this element, then shift down for this element. So now all these elements are going to be correctly created as uh, having the heap property. And then I continue performing shift down in this fashion. So when I reach, for example, here, the heaps that are underneath are going to have already satisfy the heap property. And so I can continue in this way, performing shift down for each one of the nodes. So we know that this last element that has a child is what? Well, if this is the last element of the array that is n, so its parent is going to be equal to n over 2. So the last element that has a child is going to be element n over 2. And so we would have a for loop that would go for each one of the elements, starting from element n over 2. But I'm going to go all the way down to 1. And I would have to perform a shift down for each one of those. Now, there is also another condition that we might want to add because if the heap is empty, well, the array is empty or only has one element, it already has, satisfies the heap property and nothing has to be done. So that's why we're going to add that extra condition. So you can see our build heap method here. So just check to make sure that we have more than one element. Otherwise, as I said, it's just a heap and then we perform the operation that we have to perform. All right, so what would be the time complexity of our little algorithm? So suppose that this is the tree that we have at that point, and I'm going to identify the depth of the tree as d. So how deep it is to go from here to here, because you see, if I am here at this point, how many operations do I have to go in order to get all the way to the bottom? A shift down operation might require me to go all the way to the bottom of the tree. So the number of operations for each one of those uh, shift downs is going to be equal to the number of operations here, which is equal to the depth of the tree. So what is the depth for this first node? Well, the depth for this first node, we know that the depth of the tree is log of n. So the depth is log of n here. What is the depth for this one? that appears here. Well, the left step for this one is going to be log of n minus 1, and so on, right? So let's say that the depth for this element here at this point is d, and so we continue. So we are decrementing. So what is the depth of the nodes that are uh, the leaves of the tree is going to be 0? And what is the depth of this is going to be 1, and the depth of the next one is going to be 2. So we have, these are the values of the different depths. All right, so the levels. 
I'm going to number the levels starting from this as level zero. This is level one. And so this would be level two. So if, if I wrote here the depth, that would be log of n minus two, right? And so we can keep going. And the last level here is going to have log of n. And this one is going to be log of n minus one. All right, so next thing that I want to check out is the number of nodes that we have. So how many nodes we have at level zero? At level zero, we have one node. How many nodes we have at level one? We have two to the one nodes. How many nodes we have at level two? It's going to be two to the two nodes and so on. All right, so let's see if we can figure some formulas out from this. So first, uh, let's see if there is a relationship between level i and depth d. So notice that d in this case is log of n minus 2, which is log of n minus i. So I know that the depth is equal to log of n minus i, where i is the corresponding level. Something else that I can check is that the number of nodes in a level, so this is the number of nodes in each level, nodes in each level. So the number of nodes in each level is going to be equal to two to the two to the corresponding level number. So it's going to be two to the i. All right. So from here and from here, let's see if we can conclude something. So from here, I can solve for i and I have that i is going to be equal to log of n minus d. So if we rewrite it in that way, we get the following. We have number of nodes is going to be equal to 2 to the i, but i is log of n minus d. And so this is equal to 2 to the log of n times 2 to the minus d, which is n divided by 2 to the d. All right, so the number of nodes in each level is going to be n over 2 to the d. So once we have this as the number of nodes, so what is the amount of work that the algorithm would do? Well, the algorithm that would do the amount of work that we need to do at a given level. So um, at depth d, the amount of work is going to be equal to how many operations do we need? Well, it's number of nodes that are at that level, which is n over 2 to the d nodes at that level times the number of operations that I need to perform at that particular level, which is equal to the corresponding depth, right? And we already wrote the depth here, which is d depth, okay? So it is n over 2 to the d times d for depth. All right, so the total amount of work of the algorithm, so this is amount of work at level or depth d. We're calling it depth, okay? So depth equals to d. So we have to take the summation over all possible depths. So this goes from depth equals one. We're not starting from depth equals zero because we are not actually starting from the leaves. So we are actually starting from the first node that has children. So we're going to start from the equals one and we go all the way to the largest possible depth, which is log of n. So this goes all the way to log of n of d times n divided by two to the d. So from here, we can safely put the n outside of the summation and we end up with n summation from d equals 1 to log of n of d over 2 to the d. All right, so next thing that we have to do is we have to solve the summation in order to compute the running time. So notice this is the total running time, right? So the total running time of our algorithm is going to be less than or equal to n times the summation that I wrote here, right? D equals one 
log of n of d over 2 to the d. In order to solve this summation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute this summation all the way to infinity. So I want to see what is the summation from d equals 1 to infinity equal to, because this summation is less than or equal to n times the summation that goes from d equals 1 to infinity of d over 2 to the d. So I'm just going to take a look at the summation, the summation here, and see what its value is. So let me start by writing down the summation itself. So I have, let's say that s is equal to the summation. So s is equal to the summation from d equals 1 to infinity of d over 2 to the d. So this is equal to, let me expand it. So when this is equal to 1, this is 1 over 2. When this is equal to 2, so this is 2 over 2 squared. When d is equal to 3, this is 3 over 2 to the 3, and so on. Let me compute. So 1 half of s is equal to, so 1, 1 over 2, half would be 1 over 2 squared. 2 over 2 squared now is going to become 2 over 2 to the 3, and then it's going to become 3 over 2 to the 4th and so on. So notice that I can pair this value with this value here, pair this value with this value, and so on. So this is 1 over 2 squared, this is 2 over 2 squared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract them. So if I subtract this minus this, you see what I get. I get 1 half, this is going to be 2 minus 1, this is going to be 3 minus 2, which is 1. Next one is going to be 4 minus 3, which is 1, and so on. So I'm always going to get 1. So it's going to be s, minus one half of s is equal to, so this is one half plus two minus one is going to be one over two squared plus three minus one, that is going to be one over two cubed, and so on. This summation we already know, this summation is equal to one, so we have s minus one half of s is equal to one, and from here we can obtain the value of s, so this implies that the value of s minus one half of s is one half of s, so one half of s is equal to one, so s is equal to two. So that means that the running time of my algorithm, of the build q algorithm, is going to be less than or equal to n times the summation, but the summation is actually less than 2. So this is less than or equal to 2 times n, which means that the algorithm is in the order of n. So it's a linear time algorithm, which is much better than the order of n log n that we thought that we could do with brute force. So taking advantage that we know that build heap takes linear time, we can build an algorithm to sort any list of numbers. So this is basically a very simple application of priority queues. So the idea is we initially are given an array that we want to sort. We build a queue based on that. So that priority queue that is going to contain the initial array is going to be very easy for us to extract the maximum. So each time that we extract the maximum, we just put the maximum at the end of the array and we keep going. So basically, while the, queue, while the queue is not empty, we just keep extracting the maximum one element at a time and placing it in the value, in the position of the last element of the array. We, of course, are going to assume that extract max actually decrements the value of n, so that the next time that we uh, compute this value, it's going to give me a of n minus 1 and so on. So the worst case time complexity of the heap sort algorithm is as follows, because we already know that BLQ takes linear time, and this is going to require n repetitions of extracting the maximum. We know that extract max takes in the order of log n time, and since it's going to be performed in the order of n times, actually n times, while the queue is not empty, we have exactly n elements in the array. And every time we just extract one element, and so the total running time is going to be in the order of n log n, which is a very simple application of of uh, priority queues. All right, we're going to be talking about shortest paths in graphs, starting from our next lecture. 
and one of the algorithms or several of the algorithms that we're going to be using from now on are going to be using priority queues at some point. All right, so that's it for today, and I will talk to you next time. Okay, bye.